Hi, I'm Dr. Rosa Bragan Mealy from Toronto, Canada, and I am a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm here to talk to you today about IOL choices for our patients with regards to different types of eyes that we may be presented with in our office. Today, we're going to review IOL choices for the healthy eye for the irregular corneal astigmatism eye, and for those eyes that may have retinal disease processes going on. So it's very important when we're examining our patients to look at the overall health of the eye. So the most important process is the patient history and listening to the patient's needs. Do they have any comorbidities? that may preclude using certain IOLs? Do they have a family history of certain disease processes? What are their lifestyle and visual needs? What are their current prescription? It really is important because if they're low myopes, they might want to remain a low myope. Um, and also just asking the patient exactly what their expectations are from surgery is very important. Some patients don't want to get rid of glasses and want to continue using them. And so we need to listen to our patient needs. Then we have to do a full and proper slit lab examination, looking for any corneal issues such as dry eye, which is very important, or epithelial basement membrane disease, and also looking for any glaucoma or retinal problems that the patient may have, such as diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration. And then comes all the ancillary tests that are vital in picking out whether the eye is healthy or not. Axial length measurements using non-contact optical biometers are highly accurate these days with respect to both the Lens Star and the Eyewell Master with the Barrett formulas and True K formulas on them. And ultrasound biometry is still very useful, specifically if you do manual case and you're able to have those done either by yourself or someone else, they can help you determine the corneal health. Corneal power assessment with placido disc based devices or Schleim food based devices is very important as well to make sure that you have proper corneal health, that there isn't any atypical aberrations that would preclude any sort of IOL. So this identifies the risk, needs, and preferences of the patient, it also helps you listen to your patient and develop a good rapport before the surgery so that you save your chair time after. And what I like to say is that if you see things beforehand, you turn a complication into an expectation. And I think that's very important when dealing with IOL choices and patient needs. So for a patient with healthy eyes, there are a multitude of IOL choices available depending on what the patient needs are or what the patient would like to have from the surgery. There are monofocal lenses available that offer a distinct single focus and the patient needs to understand that they're either gonna see distance or they're gonna see up close depending on what they, their needs are. The low myopes tend to wanna just take their glasses off and read. And so you need to ask your patient what's important for them. Then with respect to multifocals, there's really a newer generation of multifocals, trifocals that have largely replaced the bifocals that are on the market. There are both refractive and diffractive designs available, and they really do allow for spectacle independence, allowing distance, most intermediate and near point needs for patients. But multifocals can cause visual aberrations, and so you need to consent the patient for that and make them aware. The extended depth of focus IOL portfolio has really grown recently. There are really some that are based on a diffractive principle, and there's some based on an X-wave technology. Those based on a diffractive principle do good, give good distance and intermediate vision, but lack in some near and can still provide some visual aberration. Uh, less than a trifocal or multifocal, but they are still there. With respect to X-Wave technology, it really has a quality of a monofocal IOL with respect to contrast sensitivity and visual aberration profile. But what it does allow is very good distance vision, intermediate vision, and if you do a little bit of mini monovision, so the non-distant dominant eye at minus 0.5 to minus 0.75, because these lenses have such a sweet spot for distance vision, you can actually give them a range of vision and give them functional near. So at about 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters versus 33 centimeters, and they get a depth of focus 
um, without compromise on these patient eyes. So there are different visual compromises and visual benefits with a trifocal versus an extended depth of focus eye wall. A trifocal eye wall, and there are many companies that produce them, will give you good near, good intermediate, and good far vision. And the near is at 40 to 33 centimeters. So patients are able to have a full range of vision and be spectacle independent with a little bit of neuroadaptation, but they will compromise on some visual dysphotopsias. There will be some halo and glare for these lenses, and there will be a reduction in contrast sensitivity. Extended depth of focus lenses give you excellent far vision and very good intermediate vision, but the compromise traditionally is with near vision. And so you will have a patient that will have very little compromise in contrast sensitivity and visual dysphotopsias, but their near vision may lack as compared to a trifocal eye well. And that's where you may have to do a bit of mini monovision depending on the patient requirements and needs. But with respect to full range of vision, trifocals will beat an EDF eye well, but an EDF eye well has a kinder contrast sensitivity and visual dysphotopsia profile. So if the patient has an active lifestyle and a challenging personality, then you are faced with a challenge. Um, the perfectionist personality is probably the hardest or most difficult um, thing to deal with because these patients are not willing to tolerate less than perfect vision, which is really um, not able to be performed with any lens that is available on the market. So these patients really need to be counseled um, and perhaps should have a monofocal IOL, um, but at least be counseled that a trifocal IOL will give them halo and glare and that these patients will not be happy perhaps with their range of vision. Their expectations are too high. But the active lifestyle patient is a very different question. Depends what their lifestyle entails. They will do well with a trifocal or an EDF IOL, but if they are a perfectionist personality, then I would steer away from the trifocal IOL. Because trifocal IR wells, like I've said in the past, will give glare and halo and reduce contrast sensitivity. And there is a neuroadaptation process that needs to occur. And if the patient is expecting perfect vision, they may be very rigid against giving the lenses a chance. And they have to be willing to give the lenses a chance. Sometimes it can take up to one or two months before the brain neuroadapts and they start to get that range of vision. If they're unable to neuroadapt, they may not even get any intermediate or near vision and be in reading glasses and then have the halo and glare. So for the healthy eye, plus or minus the demanding personality, you really need to counsel the patient beforehand. I do think most of your time should be spent on a proper informed consent as I've said in other uh, presentations, that if you can turn a complication that isn't a complication, but a perceived complication, like a dry eye that may have been there beforehand, like the visual aberrations, into an expectation, then the patients tend to be happier and they don't blame you for the problem. I love it. I counsel my patients, even with EDF IOLs, that they may get halo and glare look for it, get ready for it. And what I love hearing is when they come back and say, doc, you talked about halo and glare and I never had it. That to me is better than, oh my goodness, all I see is halo and glare and you never told me about it. So I think that's a very important thing is the pre-op counseling. Determining the patient visual needs if they even want to be out of glasses or in glasses. And it's really hard in a five or 10 minute interview to determine personality. Um, so I ask them, out front, I say, look, I'm a type A personality. Are you a type A? Do you expect perfection? Because if you do, I'm not sure we can deliver that. You do need to let them know there will be a neuroadaptation 
process with any eye well we put in the eye um, because you are changing their visual aberration profile and that there will be a period of time that they will need to get used to these lenses like they do with glasses when they have to get a new pair of glasses um, for themselves. It took a day or two. In this, it might take a week or two before they get used to it. And with the trifocal and the EDF eye wells, what I find is really is a binocular phenomenon. So although you can implant them monocularly and patients do quite well, especially if they've got a monofocal in the other eye or their own natural lens in the other eye, it is much more helpful for neuroadaptation when both eyes have the surgery done a week apart and then they start to neuroadapt together. And, and the photo phenomenon are very important just in the pre-op counseling to let them know that that will occur and that they will get better with time, but that they need to be patient with that as well. Hi, I'm Dr. Rosa bragan Neely from Toronto, Canada, and I am a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm here to talk to you today about IOL choices for our patients with regards to different types of eyes that we may be presented with in our office. Today, we're going to review IOL choices for the healthy eye, for the irregular corneal astigmatism eye, and for those eyes that may have retinal disease processes going on. So irregular astigmatism can actually be one of the most challenging cases you can be presented with. Really, the biggest cause of irregular astigmatism and something that we have to be aware of if we are using premium IOLs in our practices is dry eye syndrome. Dry eye syndrome is an important pickup because a lot of times patients don't have symptoms. It's easy if they have symptoms, doc, my eyes are blurry, intermittently might be a symptom of dry eye, or, you know, I feel like there's sand or a grainy sensation. That's a great symptom if they have it because then they're used to that. But if you don't listen to the patient complaints, especially of intermittent blurry vision, you may miss dry eye. And if you don't do corneal topography on your patients, you may also miss dry eye. It's important to look for dry eye on topography, on your optical biometry. It's important to have multiple calculations. That's why I do an eye well master. I do manual case. I do topography to see if not only is the astigmatism irregular, but is it different either in power or access on any of those three tests um, or all three are different, then you know you have to look for dry eye. You can stain the cornea with fluorescein or rose bengal or lysamine green, which will show you, the latter two will show you more of a dry eye syndrome, but you also want to look at their meibomian glands and see what they look like, whether they're insipated or anything like that. And so you have multiple layers to the tear film here, which is important, and you may need to pretreat and then bring the patient back and redo your measurements afterwards. So very important to look for this because this can come back and bite you if you don't look for it. With respect to irregular astigmatism, you have to look at the causes. If the causes is dry eye, then you are, I'm very wary in putting in a toric eye well until I know that I have stabilized both the axis and the power of the astigmatism. Because if I put in a toric eye well for their dry eye at the time being, um, I could be overcorrecting, undercorrecting, or putting them in the wrong axis. And then they're never going to get clear vision. And then if I treat the dry eye afterwards, they may have no astigmatism at all. And so it's very important that you talk to the patient about this, you bring the patient back after treatment, as we saw on the previous slide, any one of those treatments or a pathway of treatments that is necessary for the patient um, to make sure that their corneas are healthy. Um, multifocals, I don't even consider them a choice in these patients at all because they're just going to have more and more reduced contrast sensitivity and visual aberrations, and they're going to be 
upset and angry with these lenses in their eyes. And so I would not treat these patients with a multifocal IOL. There are small aperture EDF IOLs that will be available on the market. They're, they're, the IC8 IOL is a very interesting IOL um, that's been shown to reduce visual distortions caused by corneal irregularities. The other reasons for corneal irreg irregularities are previous PRK or LASIK um, or um, keratoconus, which is a really hard thing to treat. But if it's a stable keratoconus, it has a cross-linking, then you could put a toric lens in or a small aperture EDF IOL. They are very interesting because they do help um, minimize the photic phenomenon compared to a multifocal and accommodating lens and help treat um, the patient's visual aberrations. A toric EDF IOL with X-Wave technology they are kinder than a multifocal or a trifocal IOL. But again, um, depending on the cause of the irregular astigmatism, I would be wary putting these lenses in until I've treated or stabilized the underlying cause. If it is a dry eye, you do need to treat them beforehand before you offer the patient these lenses. They are more forgiving, but you do need to treat it and stabilize. Once stabilized, then they are a consideration for these patients. However, you do need to stabilize their corneas, and I can't stress that enough, and let the patient know beforehand. Well, you do need to balance expectation with visual needs for patients. Work and lifestyle choices, goals and expectations are all very important. Patients with irregular astigmatism, it's really hard to say they're gonna be spectacle independent or spectacle free, I hate that word, because it, you know you may need spectacles for some light reading or, or for distance, it depends on where you end up. It's very, it can become very unpredictable. So you do need to balance their goals and expectations with their eye anatomy. Um, with respect to work and lifestyle, you may even do a monofocal lens. If they're on the computer and read mostly, you may do a bit of monovision for intermediate and near, and then have them put on distance glasses when they're watching TV and driving their car if they do that less, or maybe they don't even drive a car. So again, I think what's important to reiterate is that we need to listen to the patient um, and see what their needs are. We need to inform the patient of what their eye anatomy is like and the fact that they may not fit every IOL portfolio. I think it's important to let them know those portfolios are there, but that they don't fit that um, class of eye that would be able to have a multifocal trifocal lens. That way they understand that you've at least given them the opportunity to make a choice, but that you're advising them on what the best choice is for them. And then they're going to be happier with you and their satisfaction is going to be greater. So I think irregular astigmatism is something very important to look for, very important to inform your patient about. And if it's an unstable irregular astigmatism, uh, you need to treat it beforehand, as I said before, and treat the dry eye and stabilize pre and post. Um, it needs to be stable or the irregular astigmatism will change in those patients. I think it's important to let them know that with uh, a range of vision IOL, they may have more photic phenomenon um, and distortion of vision and that perhaps it's not a great choice for them and they need to lower and manage their expectations in knowing that they may need to have spectacles after surgery to optimize their vision. That if we put a lens inside the eye that will give them a range of vision, we may make them worse and reduce their vision overall. So it might be best if these patients cannot be stabilized to just treat them with a monofocal IOL and, and then have the more spectacles afterwards. It will depend on what the patient's cornea can withstand and how stable it becomes. And it will depend on the patient needs and their patients themselves through this process of being able to treat their corneas and get a good outcome and a stable outcome for themselves. I think the best level of satisfaction is with you communicating with your patient and offering them every choice that fits their eye. And as long as they know you've taken the time to review all the processes, and believe me, I've talked to a patient about 
all of these processes, have them all keen to go for an EDFI well. I then look at their corneas and after all the testing and I call them back and say, hey, I've looked at your corneas. This is not the best option for you. We need to bring you back. We need to treat you. We need to repeat all the testing. And we may still not be able to put this lens in your eye. As long as you talk to your patients, they're okay with that because they, they may be disappointed temporarily, but then it's not a long-term disappointment. You don't have to explant a lens later on. So again, it's the preoperative counseling and looking at all the tests, all the work you do beforehand minimizes the work you have to do afterwards. With these patients, specifically the dry eye or the irregular astigmatism, if they develop a slight posterior capsular opacification, they will notice the visual phenomenon a lot quicker than other patients. And so they may need a YAG laser capsulotomy earlier and the risks involved with that need to be reviewed with the patient, or at least the patient needs to be informed of those risks. Um, and at least to come back to you as soon as any visual aberration starts to occur. There's a lot of great lenses on the market, but not every lens is for every patient. Hi, I'm Dr. Rosa bragan Mealy from Toronto, Canada, and I am a professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm here to talk to you today about IOL choices for our patients with regards to different types of eyes that we may be presented with in our office. Today, we're going to review IOL choices for the healthy eye, for the irregular corneal astigmatism eye, and for those eyes that may have retinal disease processes going on. So patients with age-related macular degeneration are very interesting patients. It depends on what kind of macular degeneration they have. It really depends on their age, and it depends on their visual need. You do need to screen all of these patients. So if you suspect macular disease or they have a family history of macular degeneration, I would say that optical coherence tomography is very, very important, whether you can bill for it or not in these patients. In Canada, when a patient is having cataract surgery, we can't bill for an OCT as part of the cataract surgery portfolio. We can't bill the patient and we can't bill the government. So we do them for free if we feel it's necessary because believe me, it's going to save you time and hassle later on if you diagnose this early. You do need to look for this because cataracts can mask a lot of these disease processes. So it's important to do an OCT. And you wanna talk about the quality of life benefits for these patients. Patients with early AMD, um, just some drusen, and if they're over the age of 80, it's unlikely that it's going to progress, but you just never know, but you need to talk to them about it, have them on the proper therapy for it, being the multivitamin therapy, if it's a dry AMD, and you can talk to them very differently than those with bilateral wet AMD because neovascular AMD will give them a different type of central vision. And so you need to know what type of AMD they have, maybe work with a retina specialist on this, delay surgery with neovascular, or early neovascular AMD until they get stabilized on their injections. Um, and then work with a retina specialist if it is a neovascular AMD in timing the surgery in between their injections. That's what I like to do. So if their injections are three or four weeks apart, I tend to try to do their surgery right in the middle. So they have an injection two weeks before and then injection one or two weeks afterwards. And that minimizes any reactivation of the neovascular AMD. So patients with macular degeneration, again, we have to consider what their lifestyle needs are, the type of AMD they have and how advanced it is. But basically right now on the table, pretty much everything except a trifocal IOL or a multifocal IOL. A multifocal or a trifocal IOL will decrease contraindensitivity and the patients with already a retinal disease have decreased contrast sensitivity. So you're gonna to add to that. And so you will not have a patient with a happy visual outcome. So I completely take these lenses off the table. Monofocal IOLs 
are an easy fix. They're going to get good distance vision or near vision, whichever they prefer, but they're not going to have any compromise in contrast sensitivity and no visual aberrations at all. And for these patients, I prefer an aspheric IOL just because I think it adds to the contrast sensitivity and to the night vision. And so as long as they can afford that choice, I think it is a good choice for them. If they have astigmatism, I think toric IOLs are an absolute okay for them if they're able to, to afford it and they want to fix their astigmatism and, and try to get out of glasses. So for me, monofocal aspheric toric IOLs are all an option for both dry and wet AMD. With respect to EDF IOLs, it depends on the degree of AMD. If it's early AMD, then you can counsel the patient, talk to them about it. It will give them a range of vision. It'll allow them a lifestyle choice um, as long as their expectations are clear that their AMD may progress and they're investing in a temporary, I don't know how long, um, need for a lifestyle balance. With respect to magnifying IOLs, there are Galilean type of telescopes, um, other configurations are available. And these are something that, that can be offered to patients, more of a specialized surgeon or a low vision surgeon would offer this to these patients. Um, and these would be patients with really severe visual compromise from their macular degeneration um, that really have no other choice available to them. So I tend to avoid multifocal lenses in patients with retinal disease. And by multifocal, I mean bifocal, trifocal, uh, even diffractive extended depth of focus eye wells. Um, just because I do think they're associated with a reduced contrast sensitivity and higher order aberrations compared to a monofocal IOL. So I try to avoid them because the last thing I want to do is make my patients worse than better. Um, and so, but a recent review focused on contrast sensitivity with multifocal IOLs found that there was no evidence to suggest that patients with macular diseases should be advised against their use. Now, it's very difficult to assess contrast sensitivity outcomes, um, and I think it really is a gut feeling and how you feel with your patients, but I tend to avoid a multifocal eye well. I will use an extended depth of focus eye well if the patient expectations are there. So again, as we've discussed in previous presentations, it's important to understand what the patient wants or needs, but it's also important for you to let them understand what their potential outcomes could be and whether their prognosis is guarded or not. So I let these patients know that even though we're going to try to do everything to meet their expectations or their visual needs, that we may be limited by their retina. I definitely think by brightening their vision, by giving them peripheral vision, that they become happier, that they can see better, that they can get around better and function better. And so I think that these patients are well worth doing surgery on, period. So if a patient is not 100% happy with their vision after cataract surgery, um, their expectations they feel haven't been met, specifically I'm talking more about those that have had torque eye wells or um, premium EDF eye wells or trifocal eye wells in their eyes, then we have to look at possible enhancements after surgery. I think it's very important though to first point out that we can't be reactive. We can't jump if they're unhappy at day one or even week one. We have to counsel our patients that they do need to take time to neuroadapt that it could be a month or two or even three months I'd like to wait before I jump into any enhancement surgery because sometimes it's just the lens, lens excuse me, shifting a little bit within the eye. Um, it may shift back into place. It's a healing process. It's a neuroadaptation process. It may be a bit of dry eye post-op that wasn't there pre-op, so look for that and treat that. But if you find nothing and after three months, the patient is still having some residual refractive error um, that is not uh, giving them the ability to see as you and them expected to see, um, then we need to look at enhancements. Then you have three options that you can do. You can actually four. If the patient's okay with leaving it the way it is, 
then leave it the way it is. And if they're happy, I'm happy, even though the refractive outcome might not be exactly what I wanted. If they're happy, okay, that's it. I'm done. With respect to if they're unhappy and I'm unhappy, then there is laser carefractive surgery, either LASIK or PRK, to do a touch-up if they're slightly hyperopic or myopic or there's a little bit of astigmatism left over. And with respect to piggyback IOLs, piggybacks could be a good choice if you're really off on refractive error and the patient's corneas just shouldn't have um, a refractive procedure on them if they have a dry eye. Piggyback IOLs also have been shown to reduce um, the visual dysphotopsia of um, the arc dysphotopsia, the positive and negative dysphotopsia that can occur and be debilitating to some patients. Um, and so that's something to look at. With respect to posterior capsule opacification, this is a really, really tough point because if the patient has a PCO and they have a refractive or error or a visual issue, like a dysphotopsia that's not going away, it's really hard to make the compromise of doing a YAC capsulotomy, where now you can't do an IOL exchange on these patients, versus knowing if I do an IOL exchange, I'm compromising their near vision now. And so you really have to talk to the patient about it. So even more so than piggyback IOLs, an IOL exchange is an option. If you're totally off on refractive error um, and you know that it was just an issue in picking the lens or maybe you didn't hit your refractive target exactly what your expectations or the patient expectations were, you can always do an IOL exchange even three to six months, even longer after surgery um, or manipulate a toric lens into the right uh, astigmatism correction before you do LASIK or a piggyback IOL. I would encourage you to do those. But once you've done YAC capsulotomy, it's really hard to do an IOL exchange. So I would urge you to make sure you look at everything before you do a YAC to make sure the patient doesn't need an IOL exchange 